Okay. Welcome everyone to the final project showcase. My name is Gretchen. I am part of the community team here at Flatiron. We are joined by three of our recent graduates. Um, big congrats to all of you. And we are lucky enough tonight to be have a representative from each of our disciplines. Um, so we have software engineering, product design, and data science here. Um, so you'll get a little bit of a taste of each of the disciplines, which is really, really cool. Um, so yeah, so these, our panelists tonight um, have just graduated the program, huge, huge accomplishment, and they are going to show off um, what they have been working towards this whole time. So I'm super excited um, to, for you all to see this. Um, a couple of just things really fast. Please feel free to interact by asking any questions that you may have. You can use the chat box to put your question in at any point during the presentation. You can just go ahead as soon as you think of a question, put it into the chat box or use the question and answer box that's on your screen as well. Um, and then I will make sure to uh, field all those questions to the participants after their presentation is over. So each presentation will be about five minutes and then um, and then we'll give a couple of minutes to field all the questions for you all. So don't be shy, whatever question it is, just feel free to put it in the chat box and I will make sure to get to it. Um, and we can go and get started. We're gonna start with one of our product designers. Please welcome Boyka Jamstron. Hello, nice to meet everyone. All right, let me start by sharing my screen. All right, just to check, can everyone see? All right. All right, and I shall begin. Hello everyone, I am Boyinkisha Jamstran. You can call me Boyka. I'm a product designer. Uh, first off, I wanna thank everyone for giving me their time today. And with that, let's just get started. Here's a quick breakdown of my research process. And to get here, I conducted the research process in two weeks time constraint. For this project, I specialize as a UX researcher. The tools I use are listed. And for a brief introduction, Build Early Money Habits provides age-based interactive money lessons for children 10 to 12 years old. It's a five-week interactive life course taught via Zoom where children learn about personal finance. So what's the problem here? Courses such as this program already exist. How do we justify the need for another virtual financial course? And is there a market for it? In order to answer this question, I decided to start with the primary research. The primary research began with the process of creating a, a research guide and an interview script. Once that was complete, I was ready to start the interview process. For my qualitative research, I decided to conduct interviews who, uh, with users who fit the market criteria. In short, parents who have at least one child between the ages of 12. From the interview transcripts, I created an affinity diagram to organize similar concepts and ideas to find common themes and patterns. And here's what I found. Only one out of eight parents received financial education from their parents. Seven out of eight parents grew up in a household where money was a sensitive subject and not to be discussed in front of them when they were young. However, because of that, the majority of the parents today are more willing to be transparent about money topics with their own children in hopes to educate their children through exposure early on. Overall, all parents thought a virtual financial program was a great idea, and six out of eight parents were interested in enrolling their kids. Now, in regards to how the children learned finance through this course, most parents were concerned with the format of delivery and instruction. Turns out, Majority of children today have high interest in video games such as Roblox and Minecraft, and they understood kids would need something interactive in order to attract their attention. Two out of eight parents I interviewed also had kids with ADHD, and they were concerned with the accessibility issues, and they also required a format that would accommodate them. Overall, parents just want their kids to learn about money, and through financial literacy, they hope that their children can have a better future. Not that we understand that money can be an emotional subject, I sought a more empathetic approach by creating a user persona to better understand the pain points and the needs of our target audience. So let me introduce you to Holly. She's a parent of two who struggles with financial literacy and wants to give their kids the tools, the tools to better understand how money works in the world so that they won't repeat the same financial mistakes as she did when they become adults. 
Now, based on the user persona, here's my problem statement. Parents need a financial education program catered toward their kids in order for them to gain a better financial understanding to navigate a more financially secure future. Now that we've clearly established a need for this product, here's our next problem. From a business standpoint, is this a product worth investing time and money in? And if so, how do we make it stand out? In order to find answers for this question, I decided to do a secondary research, and it begins with domain research. And the purpose of this is to try to further my understanding of the product space and where our product and services reside. When I was doing my research, I had a realization. We're going through a pandemic right now. And this made me question when the pandemic first started, how were kids affected when all their learning formats suddenly changed to remote learning via Zoom? And here's what I found. According to New York Times, when Zoom starts glitching, freezing, blurring, and the audio goes out of sync, our brain subconsciously starts to work really hard to make sense of these social cues, which then makes us feel vaguely disturbed, uneasy, and tired without quite knowing why. And according to Forbes, even though Zoom has uh, breakout rooms and all these other sorts of engagement features, the main use is for lectures in classroom settings. And this unidirectional teacher-centric method is less effective than a multidirectional project-based student-centered approach. And here's why it's less effective. Based on a scientific journal published in PNAS, students who learn more uh, when they are actively engaged in the classroom than they do in a passive lecture environment. Now for the competitive analysis, I chose three competitors to compare. And here are my main insights. Only one competitor combined games alongside lessons. One competitor offered project-based coursework. Two competitors offered classes via Zoom with an instructor. Two competitors provide a personalized lessons based on the child's interests, learning styles, and development style. And none of them had a mobile app. And none of them ticked all the check marks either. Based on both my primary and secondary research, virtual lectures with Zoom alone will lack in comparison to other competitors if it's the only learning tool used for instruction. And since most kids are into video games, I recommend integrating gamification to the program. Aside from Zoom, I also recommend looking to what other platforms can this program can be completed on. Can we do it on a mobile app, tablet, desktop, et cetera? And lastly, in regards to concerns about meeting accessibility standards, I recommend the program present a variety of lessons offered in different formats based on the child's needs. And with that, I wish I just had more time with this project. I would have loved to own this project as a whole by diving into the UX design and the UI design. Um, and that's it. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and if you want to connect, I left my LinkedIn below. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Awesome, Boyka, thank you so much. Yeah, everyone, please write down um, uh, Boyka's LinkedIn there at the bottom where you can take a screenshot if that's easier. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please put them in the question and answer box. Um, and if you think of something further down the line, you can totally just put that in and I will make sure to, we'll, we'll circle back around. We're gonna have time, I think, to circle back around. I have a question though. Um, uh, the parents that you surveyed, I find it interesting that so many of them grew up in a household where money was like a taboo subject. And I'm just wondering about the population that you um, were selecting from. Like, was it, you know, like a certain age range of like, were the parents all a certain age or like ethnic background? Or was there any kind of similarities there or was like more, a little bit more diverse? I'm just curious about that. I'd say everyone was fairly similar. And I was surprised too. Um, I thought by a, coming from a definite, a different um, ethnic background, possibly different age group would change the answers. But um, a lot of the people I interviewed were millennials. Um, there are people over 50. There were people that grew up in India. Um, and majority of them had parents who just viewed money as such a taboo topic to talk about, uh, talk about around their kids. So I thought that was interesting as well. Yeah, super interesting. Um, and then can I ask you one more question? <laughs> uh, just because I went for um, a PhD and I was working on my dissertation and 
there was a slide that you had with like a ton of digital post-its it looked like. Um, and I'm wondering, cause I used just physical real life post-its for my dissertation. And I was writing down like all the themes and they were all over my house. So what program is that that you used? <laughs> um, it's on FigGen. It's through Figma and it's basically the same thing. It's a uh, digital post-its, um, but uh, and the affinity diagram can be done uh, with just physical post-its. I've seen a lot of people do that as well. But for me, I found it convenient through a digital space. Yeah, I love that. Thank you, Boyka. Again, everyone, make sure that you write down um, her information. Oh, looks like we do have two questions. Um, one, were there any parents that gave their young children allowances? Any insights you heard that surprised you? Um, yes, I've had people um, give their children allowances. Um, but one of the things I saw was a lot of parents try um, different methods to teach their kids about financial topics. One of the more common ones that I saw was the chores method where people put like a chores with, you know, if you complete this chore, this is how much you'll get paid. And, you know, it was working for a while, but always just, you know, they kind of gave up throughout of it. And from what I understood, a lot of these parents just don't really know how to teach their uh, children about money in a way that'll stick with them as they grow up. Interesting. Um, okay. And then the last question in your conclusion, what's the best way for students to learn online? Did you get any insights about that? Um, definitely more research needs to be done in terms of exactly, because uh, I don't exactly write the, uh, um, the um, educational formats or the programs itself. That's going to be taught to the kids, but I think definitely integrating some sort of gamification and you know, a lot of these kids play Roblox, Minecraft, maybe integrating some of the familiar, familiarity of it into the lessons might be a great way for them to not only um, interact with it, but also it'll, I hope it's something that'll stick <laughs> um, as opposed to uh, more of just a lecture-based format. Because I had other parents who you know, were taught uh, many topics when they were young, and went to like elementary schools, had classes. And even though they knew they went through a program that taught them financial skills, they completely forgot it as they grew older. So that's one of the main problems. How do we make what they learn stick as they grow older? But definitely yeah. more needs research needs to be done. <laughs> yeah, I could imagine, you know, like that there has to be a kind of a way to be consistent with it, like after the age of 12, like after they complete this program or whatever it is, because, um, and to like have them give them real world application skills for it, because then by the time they actually are using their own money, it, I would imagine that a lot of that would be gone as well. Um, okay. And then the last question, sorry, there was one more, um, allowance wise, do parents, did you find that parents pay more with inflation? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The kids are still getting paid 25 cents to make their bed. <laughs> All right. But could, thank you so, so much. This is super fascinating. You're a big round of applause, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, okay. Um, oh, the chat is disabled. Wondering if this is for everyone. Um, is anyone able to answer, type in the chat? I'm not seeing anything that would, let me see if I can do something really quick. Mm. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything that would disable chat. Um, so I guess if you have anything, just put it into the question and answer box for now. Zoom is being super picky today. Oh, oh, okay. Um, all right. So we are going to go on to our next presenter. Um, please welcome our most recent graduate from the data science program, Jonathan Holtz. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, everybody seeing it? 
All right. And make sure I don't go long. Here we go. Hi, I am Jonathan Holt. I'm a data analyst and business consultant. I love using data to solve problems and come up with creative solutions uh, that, to problems that arise in, in the business world. Today, we're looking at using predictive modeling to get more five-star Airbnb reviews. And you've probably stayed in Airbnb or something similar, and you know that you can leave reviews for many, many, many different aspects, including you know, how clean the unit is, where it's located, how much the host interacted with you. Uh, so why is the overall rating so important? Well, first, it's because it is the one criteria that Airbnb uses to measure success. It does, it's not an aggregate of all the other scores. It is a unique score that, uh, that they weight a lot higher than any of the other aspects. So we're, what's the issue here? Well, first, let's just look at the idea of a star rating. So if you get you can give five stars. You can only give whole stars, not partial stars. What would you assume uh, would be the value of the stars? And I don't know exactly what you would think, but I know that I think that a three would be average, four and five would be above average, and one and two would be below average or bad. Unfortunately, that's not the way that Airbnb sees things. This is uh, how they weight things. Now, these are average scores, but 4.7 is what they consider average. Lower than that, you're in the danger zone. You're uh, doing poorly. And if you have a 4.3 average or lower, you're at risk of being delisted from the service altogether. And again, you can only give whole stars. So that's why getting just a four-star review can really impact your overall rating. It would take five, five, I'm sorry, four five-star reviews to make up for a single four-star review and 10 five-star reviews to make up for a single three-star review. So we can see the impact there. So how I went about answering, uh, solving this problem was I created a classification model that identified the top performing units. I call them elite units. They are the units that have that 5.0 overall rating. And in order to get that, of course, they have to be getting nothing but five-star reviews. I then uh, wanted to identify the features that had the most impact on that classification. So what things made the most impact on being an elite unit. And then from there, I can make recommendations about specific things that an Airbnb host can do to solve this problem. The data I used, I got from insideairbnb.com. It was over 10,000 records. All of them are from San Diego because that was the case that I used for this project. However, this could uh, be expanded uh, there's data for many other cities. In fact, that's something I would like to do going forward when I've got a little more time. So here's the modeling process that I used. Started with a basic classifier and then worked my way through more complex methods. For each method, I also did, uh, it's called a grid search. It's basically a parameter optimization. I told it what I was looking for, and then it told me, hey, here's how you can tune uh, these little things to give you what you're looking for. And what I was looking for was precision, which means uh, if my model classified something as an elite unit, I wanted it to be a, a, a pretty much a sure thing that it was right. And these were the results. Uh, as you can see in the upper right, my optimized decision tree uh, classified 83% of the elite units correctly using all other data and not not the um, not actually knowing. So that's what I ended up choosing as my final model. And so what I learned from uh, looking at that model, this, these are the features that have the most impact on getting five-star reviews. Now, I had 15 different features that I was looking at. These are the only four that had any score at all. And as you can see, accuracy significantly larger than anything else. That's helpful because looking at it further, I saw that accuracy has a nearly one-to-one -one relationship with overall rating. So if you've got like a 4.5 accuracy rating, you're probably in the neighborhood of a 4.5 overall rating. And while overall is a very nebulous thing, if I tell, tell a host, hey, you need to improve overall, it's like, well, what do I do? But if I say you need to improve your accuracy, well, that's a much better target to have. And it's also looking at the data, a problem that a lot of hosts have. So here were my recommendations. They basically were just be honest. 
when, in how you present your property. Uh, don't, you don't want to set unreasonable expectations. You don't want to use too much sales language. You just want to be honest about here's where the house is. You know, if there's a few things that are wrong, just let people know. Post a lot of pictures. Uh, if a person can visualize the property before they get there, it's going to be great for helping with expectations. Communicate often uh, so you can be hearing what their expectations are and helping set the expectations. But most importantly is explaining Airbnb's rating scale to the guest. This was something I found online that a lot of hosts uh, use, and they'll post it in their house or they'll put it on a review, ship, a review slip. And it does a good job of explaining that if there are you know, even if there are a few issues, if you enjoyed your stay, you know, five stars would be appropriate and showing that if you get four stars, it's showing that there were a lot of issues. Then uh, I also like this because it's not coercive. You're not like trying to force people to, and it allows real feedback, but it does a good job of communicating what the scale really is. Now, my challenge is the, uh, my model only works if there are existing ratings in the other Airbnb categories. So uh, I had to drop... 14% of my data set because it didn't have uh, that information. Also, amenities would be a very useful data point to have in this analysis. Unfortunately, the data set uh, had amenities in an incredibly messy format. They're just uh, strings of text. They're not consistent. It would take a lot of time to go through it, and uh, we'd have to use uh, natural language processing, which is why that's my planned improvement. I want to take the time and do that. I think that it will be a massive benefit to this uh, to this model to be able to add that. Also, uh, like I mentioned before, increasing the scope, adding more cities. Uh, Airbnb uh, inside Airbnb has thirty U.S. cities and fifty international cities, and uh, all in the same format. With a little bit of time, they could all be rolled into this and expand the scope. But that's uh, all the time I've got. That's my model. Uh, thanks so much, and uh, let me know if you got any questions. Awesome, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Yeah, everyone, please take a screenshot of this slide if you want to reach out to Jonathan after this. That would be amazing. Um, I think that this is super fascinating as someone who uses Airbnb a lot. <laughs> um, and like, I've never seen that rating score, to be honest. Like I, and I do, I do often, I will, I would rather stay in an Airbnb than in a hotel when I travel and I'll go, that's my first go-to look. And I've never seen that rating score. That's super helpful um, yeah. because in my mind, it's like, you know, four stars is like, maybe there was just like a couple of things that's like, oh, you could maybe improve the bed or something. You know what I mean? But like, overall it was amazing, you know? Um, so that's really helpful to know. And I'm, it's, I'm curious why it's such like a, you know, like five is, it was great Four is like, there's a lot of issues. Like, do, do you have any insight of like why that's the rating? Yes, because- they Airbnb only wants the best of the best. And so that's what they did. So when they, they didn't come out and say, well, we're going to arbitrarily say 4.7 is average. They looked at across our service, what's the average rate? Um, and, and it was 4.7 stars. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just because they want such high quality. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think it's a skewed scale. If, if you're giving me a, a five point scale. I want to use all the scale. And, and, um, and a lot of people see that five star scale and they assume it's a hotel, hotel scale where like a three star hotel, that's pretty nice. Four is good. And five is like amazing. So, um, yeah, there's just a lot of, um, uh, confusion, uh, about it. Yeah. Super fascinating. Um, okay. We do have, um, a couple of questions. Um, what, I think that you kind of went over this, but just to clarify, what does define accuracy for Airbnb? Is it uh, like the accuracy of what the listing is compared to what that, what you actually show up and see? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I'd say the best way to put it is, uh, meeting, ha having the guest have accurate expectations when they get there. Mm. Um, a, low, a low accuracy rating would be, uh, or, or get, giving a lower score would be, oh, this did not look like what you told me. This is not as clean as I was told to locate you saying, oh, you can walk places from this house and then you get there and like, it's not walkable. Okay. So yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um, okay. What do you, what do you have any suggestions of what to do about reviewers who don't rate based on the Airbnb guide? 
Uh, there, there are a couple of checks in place. If someone is just basically trying to review bomb you or, or something like that, um, host can uh, reach out to Airbnb and, and basically file a complaint and do things like that. But um, the biggest thing is communication. You, you shouldn't be surprised by this as a host. You should, you know, before someone gets there, you're checking in, you know, I, I know that um, I recently stayed somewhere and I was asked, hey, we're excited you're staying here. You know, is there anything we should know? Why are you here? Is there anything you need? So getting all those things and then also touching, you know, definitely when they check in, probably while they're there, hey, how are things? Is there anything I can do for you? And then when they check out, hey, how was your experience? It gives you a chance to, you know, actually, you know, address any issues. So uh, if you do all of that, then you should know what score they're going to give you. And you, and you can drop in there. It's like, hey, if, if I solved all your problems, give me five stars, if not, you know, lower. Awesome. Um, okay, how long did it take to run this algorithm? And did you use a personal laptop computer for the computation? Uh, yes, I, I did. I just used my, I used my laptop. It did not take, uh, it did, the, the thing that took the longest were those grid searches that, that I said, the parameter optimization. Those each take 10, 15 minutes to run. Um, so like once I ran them once, I kind of saved the results so I wouldn't have to run them again as I, as I tweaked stuff. Um, but running the model itself is uh, incredibly fast, especially because um, I, I didn't really get into what all the different models were. But the fact that the, the, my final model was a decision tree, that's actually one of the most basic classifiers. So it doesn't take long at all to run. Awesome. Okay. And then great job. What surprised you as well when gathering the data? Was there anything that was surprising? I was surprised maybe selfishly because I spent so much time processing the data, control it, you know, making uh, additional features and stuff. And then I run it. And then like that slide I showed you, the answer was accuracy. And I was really hoping that there was going to be, oh, here's four or five things we can do. And there were a few other categories there, but accuracy was just such a dominant thing. And it was such a one-to-one -one thing um, that that really surprised me that it was somewhat that simple, uh, <laughs> that that was the answer. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry. One more question. Um, which language and IDE are you using to run the models? Uh, I was using Python. Awesome. So, so yeah, Python and everything. And then was there any other top elite unit issues? They were, um, I mean, they, they perform better across the board. Uh, an elite unit is kind of, it's an ideal thing. So there actually aren't that many that are truly elite units out there. Uh, but um, so, so, I mean, by definition, an elite unit has that 5.0 rating. Something I didn't get into in this presentation uh, for the sake of time is another uh, big thing was the amount of the number of listings that a host had also had a negative uh, impact, had a neg negative correlation on their review score. Um, and so uh, after a while, you weren't really seeing, you know, if you, if you list 15 units, you're probably not going to be able to have that perfect um, host rating of, of five. Um, so, but the, but those elite units performed significantly better across the board on all review metrics. Awesome. And then what was the IDE that you used? I have no idea what that means, but <laughs> you do. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. Either. Okay. <laughs> that might be more of like a, might be more of a software engineering thing or something. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. <laughs> um, do you have any information on the guest ratings and does it skew the same as the host? Oh, interesting. Yeah, did you look into the guest ratings at all? I, I didn't look into the guest ratings, but that that would be a good thing uh, to look into. Um, I, I don't, because the the guest rating, I don't think had any impact on, uh, on, on what I was looking at, but uh, I would imagine, like I said, if you if you have a guest that has a low rating and then they give you a bad score, I think that would, you know, work in your favor if you, uh, if you, you know, run that up to Airbnb. But I, I don't know that that's a great, great point. That's something else maybe I should look into going forward. Awesome. Um, 
Yeah, there's a lot of uh, in the a lot of people. Thank you for IDE's integrated development environment. Um, that is more of a software engineer thing. Data science, um, our data scientists do not use that as of right now. So, um, all right, Jonathan, thank you so much again, everyone. Make sure that you take a screenshot of this and reach out. But thank you so much. Awesome job. <laughs> Um, okay, and then last, but certainly not least, we are joined by Lee Rifle, who is our most recent software engineer graduate. Welcome, Lee. Thank you, Gretchen. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, is everyone able to see my Chrome tab? Awesome. So hi everyone, as Gretchen said, my name is Lee Rifle and I am a full stack software engineer. Um, I live in Brooklyn, but believe it or not, I love to get out of the city and go upstate, travel all around the country. And it's been on my bucket list for a while to visit every national park in the US. Um, I was not tastefully blurring my background. You could see I have Zion posters and various other park paraphernalia. Um, when I travel, I have a physical passport that you can take to all of the parks and get little stamps as you go. It's a great way to record your memories. Um, unfortunately, being outside, camping, hiking, the passports get a little grimy, they get a little dirty, you lose them, etc. cetera. Um, so the inspiration for my app was to build a digital place for users to collect stamps, um, log memories of parks they've been to, add other parks to their bucket list, and just do general research about the 62 national parks that we have in America. Um, so before starting this app, I had to sort of plan my user story and what it would look like for a user to be engaging with this digital passport. Um, my foundational sort of MVP goals were that a user should be able to log in. Um, obviously, if I have my own account, I don't want to see the parks that Gretchen has been to and vice versa. So having authentication was pretty important. Um, I wanted to view all of the national parks in the US and have those update live, which means I needed to fetch data from the NPS website that was constantly updating. So for example, St. Louis, the Gateway Arch actually recently became a national park. Um, I want that data to be current so that if new national parks are added, users are always seeing those up to date. Um, I wanted users to be able to add parks to their bucket list and stamp them if they'd been there and also leave reviews or memories of the parks that they've seen, um, but also have the ability to go back and modify or delete reviews. And before becoming a software engineer, that process might have seemed very simple in my head, but I now know that under the hood, there's a lot of both front end and back end code that goes into just something as simple as modifying a post. So um, this was an MVP goal, but it was also sort of a large, a large task to undertake. And then finally, my hope was to have a map view so that users could see both a visual of where the parks are and also a description of them. Um, this purple box, my stretch goal is to add users as friends. That's what I'm working on in the next couple of weeks. So I won't get too deep into the technology because I know there's a lot of jargon, but um, what you need to know is that my app has a front end and a back end, which means that there is the visual content that's displayed to a user. Um, the front end is done in React, and that are all the, those are all the things that a user interacts with. So the buttons they can click, the pages they can scroll through, toggling to their own profile. But then the back end is where my data is stored. So once a user is created, I'm storing that user's information in the back end. Um, I created my own database where that information lives. Similarly, um, the parks that I'm fetching from an API or from the government source of parks, I wanted that data to get stored once the user interacted with it. So if I decide to save a park, that park then becomes part of my profile and that data is linked to me so that the next time I log in, all of my parks are still there. Um, other technologies, I used Google Maps to integrate the map view and I used something called Material UI, which is a styling framework. So you'll see in the buttons that I show kind of the sleek look of them. Um, that was all done with this material UI framework. I did not uh, dive too heavily into doing CSS on my own since frameworks are available for that. So with that in mind, let's jump right in. The best way to experience an app is to see it live. Um, so upon signing in or signing up, users are able to choose a username, a password, set their location and choose a profile picture. Um, so for the sake of demonstration, I'll log in as myself. Um, this is the rendered list of all of the parks so again, this is updating live. Um, we can search for a specific park that we know of. So like I said earlier, I've been to Zion. I can search in the search bar and then I have options to either, well, I can read about the park. I can view activities that are offered here. I can add it to my bucket list, which means I want to go there someday, or I can stamp my passport, which says I visited. Um, and this cute little stamp shows up. 
If I don't want to search by a park and I instead want to find a particular activity, I can filter as well. So let's say, oh, dog sledding. Let's say I'm really interested in doing some dog sledding. Um, I can filter and see that there are two national parks in Alaska. So I could go to Denali. That sounds really cool. I'm going to add it to my bucket list and I'll add this one as well. Um, so this is kind of the landing page for users where they can learn about the parks, um, see all their information. And of course, the map view, this is my Google Maps API. So this is fetching the parks from a list and rendering in the browser. One of my stretch goals is to actually make this update as well. So right now, this is just every park. I'd love to have this toggle between your bucket list, your stamped passports, and all parks. But right now, it's just every park. So let me add a couple others to my passport just for the sake of demonstration. And now we can go into the user passport. So this is where um, users have sort of a home base to start collecting memories and adding you know, details about their trips. Um, you have two options. You can actually order a poster. This is just gonna open a new tab um, for each of the parks, or you can log a memory. I loved seeing Zion with my sister and mom. I can submit our memory. It'll record when I went there. Again, this is the pesky edit feature. I really loved seeing Zion with my sister and mom. And now I can update that. Um, and then a delete feature. This is where once my friends are implemented, um, users can add other users and share a memory with them. So if my sister or mom had an account, I will be able to tag them and we'll actually see the same page in both of our passports. Finally, um, users are able to update their profile, but only minimally at this point. So the user profile has an avatar, which I put in at the beginning, um, a username, location, my bucket list, which is updating live with the two that you just saw me add, and then account of the parks that I visited. Um, if this number changes, this is fetching from, again, the API, and this number is fetching from the number of parks I've stamped. So four out of 62 will change in real time. And the profile has update features as well. So if I wanna be snobby and say specifically, I live in Brooklyn, not New York, I can submit that. And now my profile is updated. Um, some of the challenges with this app, I would say the largest challenge is that the National Park Service, um, I think their priority is staying on the ground and keeping the parks maintained. It is not maintaining an accurate uh, up-to-date API. So as a result, the API had some bugs, some typos, a lot of filtering features that made it really hard for me to choose just the parks that are tagged as national parks. So this designation. Um, so this homepage actually has a lot of logic behind the scenes to say, only show the park if its designation has the word national, not if it has the word monument, not if parks is pluralized, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of logic in here just to get the data that I wanted. Um, but once it was rendered, I was able to see, you know, does this map to all the parks we wanna show um, and kind of gut check that way. Um, this app is deployed. I deployed it a couple of days ago, so I'll share the link in a moment, but I would love to get some people using it and testing it. Um, if I'm able to get to Acadia this summer, I will definitely be bringing my passport app. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to show it off and would love to take any questions that you have. So let me come over here. Lee, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, everyone, please make sure to either write down Lee's contact information or, um, Take a screenshot. You're getting lots of love in the chat. Everyone's saying this is so well done. I agree. Um, as a, I, I love national parks. Um, I definitely would. I would definitely use this. I will use this. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really cool. I love that you can like write down your memories um, because I always like, you know, some some parks I go to more than once, um, and like. I would love to have a place where, cause I forget the trails that I did, you know, and to have like, or like the things that I did. And it's like to have a place where I can keep track of, okay, this trail, I really love this trail was just okay. Make sure that you get here at 5.00 AM. <laughs> like if you want to do this one or whatever it is. So yeah, really, yes. really cool. Um, okay. We do have a couple of um, questions. So I'm going to get to those. Uh, very cool web app. Does the national parks offer an API to pull park activities, locations, from, or do you have to add them manually? Great question. So the API has one general link that goes to just all parks and it will show um, 460 locations that have the park's name, latitude, longitude, description, activities, designation, everything you could possibly wanna know. 
Um, so I started with that giant file and sort of pared it down. But there are also a number of individual fetches you can do. So you can do just slash activities or just slash opening hours and see just a park's name with that one piece of criteria. Um, I actually went down that road initially and was getting a little overwhelmed with doing nine different fetches. So I decided to just take one sort of giant clump of data and then filter it and logic it out the way I needed it. Awesome. Um, okay, what was your engineering experience prior to Flatiron School? Not a single bit of engineering experience. Um, this was totally new to me. Um, I did informally work in, uh, I guess, middle school CS curriculum, not informally. I, I did develop curriculum for middle school um, computer science, but that was block based and it was more, you know, teaching students about the big picture of programming. I had never really written any code myself um, until 15 weeks ago. So awesome. So cool. Um, Okay, were you able to see the monuments? How, oh, how were you able to see the monuments? Um, could the asker of that question clarify what they mean by see? Do you mean in the browser, like view them or? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about, yeah. So if whoever wrote that, could you um, specify if it was like, did when like she personally saw them or <laughs> if it was like I've seen quite a few. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. While that person is clarifying, um, how many parks are listed on this website? Good question. So um, there are 62 listed right now. There are technically 63 designated. And that's because, again, what I was mentioning with the API having some funky data, Sequoia and Kings Canyon, which are right next to each other, are listed as a single park in the database, but they're listed as two parks. Um, in like, like I would say one is different from the other. So the website only has 62, but there are technically 63. Um, I'm hoping to do an add-on where I also add national monuments, which there are like 200 of. And there's also something called national preserves, which there are another 150 of. So there are a whole lot of designations for um, protected lands and, and parks. Awesome. Um, okay, what did you use to deploy this web app? Great question. Um, I deployed on Heroku. So that's I was not able to get, you know, my own fancy domain domain name. Everything I deploy is going to have this Heroku app in it. Um, if the app blows up and people love it, I might purchase rights to some sort of shorter URL. But yeah, right now it's deployed on Heroku, which took my React front end and my Rails back end and created a new database that lives um, on their hosting site. So that means now if I close my computer, the website doesn't disappear, which was the case before I deployed. Um, okay, you mentioned you weren't, I think that this is the clarification. You mentioned you weren't able to search for monuments, but only national parks. How did you overcome that? Oh, great question. Um, so the way the logic works is each of these cards um, is rendering the information in the card if a certain condition is met. So right now, the condition that it's relying on is if the piece of data anywhere in it has the phrase national park, show it on this page. But I also had to add, add logic that said, however, if it also has the word monument, don't render it on the page um, because that would make it a national monument and not a national park. So I started with the generic logic for get me all of the parks um, to get me all of the parks and then explicit to say, unless it has this feature as well. Awesome. Um, okay, on the map, what was the difference between yellow and blue tags? That is what I'm calling a feature, not a bug. Um, I have no idea why some of these are yellow and some of these are blue. It happened the other day. I did not try to color code them in any way, but um, some are yellow and some are blue. I could dig back into my API and see if I added some sort of styling, but um, for now, we'll just say there's sort of like an East Coast, West Coast color go going yeah, on. There's like a big, yeah. It's, feature not a bug that's the engineering way um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty choice um it's more aesthetically pleasing what okay what was the hardest part about building i think that you touched on this a little bit but do you want to get into yeah it? i i think i mean even in just a larger sense getting started was really challenging um for this project i had to be super diligent with my time it was tempting to work on you know a little bit of every feature every day and i had to learn that that isn't really the best way to create an app you have to do one feature to completion then start the next feature. Um, that's why when you look in the app store and there's rollouts, like they'll add a single feature at a time. You don't just get an app one day. Um, the analogy I think of is like, if someone wants a car, don't give them the wheels, then the steering wheel, then the doors, give them a scooter, then a bike, then a car. Um, so every single day your app should work. It should just have something new added that you built as opposed to ever being halfway functioning. Um, so learning that process and kind of working through that was challenging, but um, I know that going into my next projects, I'm actually really excited to plan and kind of 
hold myself back from doing too much at once. I think it worked really well. I love that. I love that analogy. I'm going to use that with students. So good. Um, question, can you upload photos to the memories? That is um, a stretch goal. So I'd love to implement both a photo upload feature and also another piece of logic that would only allow you to stamp a passport if you could verify that you were actually at this park. Um, so mm -hmm. not to like gatekeep part access, but in some ways, this is a bit of a useless app if anyone can stamp all 62 parks and not actually know that they were there. Right. So I'd love to do something with like a photo's metadata to say, if you can upload an image of the Grand Canyon that was taken at the Grand Canyon, you can stamp it. That means that you were there. Um, so that's a feature for the future, but in the meantime, just text, no photo uploads. Awesome. Um, have you shown this app in interviews? And if so, what were employers' reactions? I have not yet. Um, I'm still working out some of the, the details and the bugs. I actually, yeah, just graduated on Friday. So this is a to be presented yeah. product in interviews. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. Can you talk about the process of building from the ground up timeline other than API hangups or major hurdles? Yeah. Um, so the timeline for this was three weeks. We were kind of instructed not to start coding until the third day. And again, like I said earlier, that was a bit of a knee jerk. I didn't want to wait, but um, those first three days were just for planning. So to kind of scroll away for a minute, I took some time to map out all my components. So this was my own wireframe to say like, here's what I want my website to look like. I'm very proud that it ended up looking fairly similar to my wireframe. Um, all of this planning happened before I even had a file open on my computer with code in it. Um, so once this planning was done, it became much more manageable to say, okay, it's Thursday, I just need to do map view. That's this single button. I'm just gonna build the button. And once it works, I move on to my filter. Once that works, I move on to my images. So doing it in this piecemeal fashion, bit by bit, um, and also checking in with my instructor to sort of show what I had built and get feedback on how things were looking. Um, but yeah, it was a three week sprint. So it was pretty quick. Um, I'm excited to have the luxury of more time, but I also know that it won't feel as high pressure. And I'm like, will I get as much done in these three weeks as I did in those? So <laughs> we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Awesome. And then, um, I'm not sure that I quite understand this, but maybe you will. How do you map so many parks on the map rather than manually? Um, are they referring to the map map? Um, so this when I say a Google Maps API, that means that externally someone has created a map with all of the parks on it, and I'm just embedding it, sort of sourcing it into my website. So if we were to break down like the underlying code of this, nowhere on this page am I actually, you know, naming the park Olympic National Park or writing its description. Google Maps separately has set this frame up, and then I'm making a fetch or making a request to take that map and put it in my own website. Um, so in that sense, the map is, it's not really living in my own app, it's living elsewhere which does make it a little dangerous if, you know, Google Maps goes down, this map goes away. But in the meantime, I felt like that was the easiest way to just get the data rendered before worrying about building my own implementation of, of a map view. Awesome. Well, Lee, thank you so, so much. This was awesome. I can't wait to use it. Um, super, super thank you. great. Yeah, thank you. Um, before we head out, John, there was one more question for you that I just wanted to make sure that I circle back, but what software did you use to run the classification tests? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. There we go. Yeah, I wanted to follow up too because I think it's related back to that IDE question. I went back through the chat and, and, and looked at that. Um, everything was in Python. It was all run in Jupyter Notebooks. So this is all... Um, all the classifications, everything. It's from a scikit-learn um, a module of, um, of uh, Python. So that's what I used. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you so, so much for everyone who came. And you guys, I will say, I told, I told our panelists before we started, when we were in the practice session, I said, sometimes we get groups who like ask no questions at all. And sometimes we get groups who ask great questions. This, I think that you all who came asked the best questions of any group. I've been doing this, this once a month for two years. And I think that you all did ask the best questions. So thank you for coming and participating and being so interactive. It really helps um, it to go really well, I think, and be a little bit more interesting. Um, so thank you for all that. Thank you so much to our panelists. I think that this is like so fascinating to see like what you're all capable of building after going through this bootcamp program and not having to go through a four year degree program. So like you all did an amazing, amazing job. I hope that you're super proud of yourselves. Um, this, these were all excellent, 
excellent projects. Um, and I'm super excited to see what you do in the future and what jobs you get. Um, so keep us all posted, but thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I'll see y'all next time. Bye everyone. Thanks so much. Bye.